Gods be praised, traveller. So you want to hear my story? Come on in out of the cold. Get an ale, make yourself comfortable. And I will tell you the story. So you may have heard the tales about the wars which engulfed all of Caladia, forging the lands into what they are this day. It starts before these epic battles, before the songs were written, and the fables and myths which we told to our children. No, this begins with the whispers. About a man from the north, Gorgai Barkskin. His story starts the day he was betrayed. Like most warriors from the north, he was ambitious and filled with an internal fire which kept them alive through the winter that could only be extinguished through battle and blood to appease their gods. In a large raiding party of Northmen, plundering their way south through Caradia, taking advantage of the divided empire, Gorgai, naive and invincible, with no sign of slowing, reaped the reward with his so-called brothers in arms. Till one fateful day, Gorgai's warband had abandoned him and his comrades, sacrificed in that village so they could get away. Gorgai takes a mighty blow, bloodied, wounded, alone. He tries to survive, betrayed by his friends, left to die. The gods had another plan for him. Our story begins in the Southern Empire. This is where Gorgai had hidden some of his plunder from his raids. But not alone, he was helped by two imperial lads, the promise of coin. Gorgai, wary at first, happily accepted, as he needed to get north. The fractured factions of the Empire the Imperial lads weren't bothered he was from the north, just that they were getting paid. Gorgai was weak, injured, could barely walk and had to ride. He was staying at the city of Lycaron with the two Imperial lads. He needed their help. He had to keep his head down as he had low favour with the locals. He didn't speak much about his raids to the Imperial lads in fear they may turn him over. So he'd tell them stories of battles, unrelated, with different names and different towns. He spent a lot of his time in the tavern, with whores, drinking. His injury had made him weak. Many months passed in the city of Lycaron, but the longer Gorgai stayed there, the more interested he became in the Empire. Gorgai was weak and couldn't fight, but it was time to carry on. One morning he went to the tavern to meet some merchants he'd met in Lycaron. They told him about the different prices you could fetch from around Caradia, and also of caravans and trade. This interested Gorgai, however he'd need money, so he'd have to start small. He'd also need men, men to make a warband, as he could not return north and appear weak if he was to get revenge and appease the gods. He decided to head down south again, to Tavir, on the way he'd go to Sagora. He'd also try and recruit any men willing to join a Northman's party, but the promise of gold is often easily accepted. Sagora, however, had no men for offer, and the prices he'd note down from this village and any others he'd visit in order to get an idea of where he can make a good profit. He carried on to Tevia in hope that there's some men there. On his way though, he saw some mountain bandits. They seemed to be snooping around Tevia, so he decided to pursue them, him and his two men. Eventually, he forced them into a fight. Gorgai couldn't fight of course, but he could fire his bow. His aim may not be as true as what it was once, but he's still able to do some damage to the enemy. But was ultimately grateful for his imperial allies watching his back. 
These mountain raiders were lightly armored, and we took all they had. But they must have been scouts, as there's much larger parties nearby. Gorgai and his friends managed to circle round and take refuge at Tevia before the large party approached them. The guards there kept them safe. Another local lad wanted to join after hearing we defeated some scouts nearby. The merchants didn't have much to offer, but we were able to make some coin. Selling the armor, we stripped from the mountain scouts. The party decided to wait some time for the area to clear and a new day. Gorgai didn't want to return to Lycoran empty-handed, so he bought some bags of wool, unknowingly if he would make a profit. Next day, they set out, trying to take caution on the road. They managed to get back to Sagora. Here, he checked the prices of wool, still not what he was looking for. But to his surprise, two of the local boys had changed their mind and decided they wanted to come with Gorgai. The promise of loot and adventure is very persuasive to the young. When returning to the city, they stumbled upon some looters at what could only be described as an old battlefield. Gorgai and his men were chased away, however, they managed to scavenge some items. Nothing of value, old rags, armor, and tools, and weapons. But it was something. It was money. To buy more men. He hoped that someone would be interested in the wool, but the price was still around the same. He would hold on to it for now. It was time to leave Lycoran. The next day, Gorgai set it off to the north. Off his horse this time, as he was able to walk, and he felt this would make him stronger than being in the saddle. They reached the village of Spotia. Here they were able to buy some grain for the journeys, and also recruit some other locals. Shortly after leaving Spotia, they were engaged by a group of looters. Too many for them to take on, and they demanded coin from Gorgai. Reluctant, he decided to pay them off what he could in order to avoid a fight. This left a bitter taste in Gorgai's mouth. He would not let this happen again. After, he carried on up the river to the village of Chinopis. Here he recruited two more men and an imperial archer. His ranks were swelling. Unsure of how long he'll be traveling for, he brought more grain and using his old horse to carry the goods. From the villagers he heard of a town, a city called Mysia. One or two days to the north, he decided that would be his target for now, making his way to the next village along, Gauss. Maybe it was the size of his party, or maybe because he was travelling with imperial men, but more people wanted to join. He was glad for it. It seemed to be a recurring theme at the next village, Femis, he was able to recruit another free man. But during his time in the village of Femis, he stumbled upon a party as he waited there. A group, a flag he recognized. It was a mercenary group called Embers of the Flame. He wasn't certain. And his gut told him that these were the men, these were the men that hunted down his northern raiding party. But he wasn't sure, he had to know more. You may have heard of us, men call us embers of the flame. Generations ago, heaven instructed us to prepare for a great cleansing of the land. Until that day, we smolder in the silence. But when that day comes, our righteous wrath shall burn forth. These words sent a chill down Gorgai's spine. Mercenaries of the Embers of the Flame left the next day. Gorgai stayed put. He decided to explore the village of Femis a bit. Ask some of the locals about this Ember of the Flame mercenary. One day he will find them again. And if he is ready, he will confront them and bring glory to all those who died in the village. Gorgai sets off again to the village of Ofra. Here he waited some time for the night to pass before they could move on again in the morning. His group of companions grew again to 19 strong. They were no northern warriors, but he knew he could train these men well. The next day he set out again through the forest that led to Mysia. A bustling town, surely some work for him.
Mycia was a greater city of the Empire. The imperial architecture obvious, similar to that of Lycaron. He found himself exploring again, interested in what was different from the cities he knew back in the north. The architecture here was stronger, mainly stone. The weapons were no match. The townspeople were wary of him. But he didn't care what the locals thought. Gorgai knew he was an outsider and he liked it that way. He browsed to see what the merchants had, but nothing of interest yet. He found a couple of merchants were willing to buy his spare grain before he moved on again. As usual in any new town or city, Gorgai finds himself at the local tavern. After a few drinks with a local, he learns of some work which would be suitable for him and his men. It's something that Gorgai was interested in, and he knew this kind of work would gain him favour and of course more coin. As he was about to leave, however, he met a young girl, Karina, Karina the Wronged. My name is Gorgai, madam. Tell me about yourself, he said. So she told Gorgai of her past and how she came to be here. Her father was a wealthy merchant in Lycaron, where they had a rich house with many servants. Their neighbour, a moneylender who specialised in loans to the Imperial Guard, was their downfall when the riots came. During these riots, the guardsmen came to the neighbour's house, the moneylenders, to burn it down and to erase any records of their loans. The flames spread, spread to her house. Her father tried to save their valuables in a lockbox, dragging it through the streets, but he was targeted by robbers and looters and fell to them. Karina lived on the streets and was desperate, and one day, alone and drunk, she found the guardsman who burnt down the moneylender's home. She probably shouldn't have done it, but she did. And now she has his sword, and it's been very useful to her. Gorgai knows the starving must do what they must, and he sympathized with Karina. He was looking to grow his warband with reliable, trustworthy people. He could give Karina a chance to come along with him. He believes she could learn a lot and be an asset in the future. Their destinies would be entwined as companions. But right now, she had debts, and he needed to help pay those debts off if he wanted her in his warband. She owed him nothing, and he owed her nothing. But he could see something in her eyes. A fire to appease the gods, maybe. He would find out. The next day, he made his way through town, looking for his contact who had work for him. Her name was Katila, the marina. I don't know you, and I suppose you should tell me your name. Gorgai introduced himself. And who are you, he said. Katila made herself known, and she also said that she'd heard Gorgai's name recently, and she appreciated the efforts to make the roads safer. If only she knew about Gorgai's past. He asked her about what problems she had, and she said about some hunters she used to pay for furs and hides. But those hunters have turned on her, and banded together as a gang, trying to muscle her out of the leather business. Gorgai wondered how he could help. She wanted him to crush them at the village of Orthra. Gorgai had been there before. She did try to say that if we left some men and one of her companions with her, she'd be able to do it herself. But Gorgai didn't trust anyone he didn't know too well and decided to do the job himself. And any illegally obtained leather he can keep for himself. She told him the best way to catch the hunters, to wait in the village till midnight and then jump them. But she warned him, these men may stand and fight, as so they are bold and desperate, so he has to be vigilant. Gorgai accepted the quest, and was filled with a surprised excitement. He started to run, he wanted to get back to his men and start his quest at once. Some sort of fire burned inside of him. He found himself clutching at his axe, thinking of the fighting to come. It had been so long since he had drawn his axe. Remembering where he was, of course, he reslung his axe. He truly was excited. A new energy filled him. He prepared his party to set off straight away. Some of the men who had been with him for a while, he decided to buy them bows, as they proved themselves more than capable. Equipped and renewed of energy, he was ready to set off from Mycia.
Before they departed, he brought some cheese and some butter for his men. He decided to set out late evening, so he'd arrive there early morning. This would allow him to assess the village and the situation before engaging in the poachers. It was just to the west of Orfra, half a day's ride, and he arrived on time. Catilla told him to wait until midnight, and that's when he would be able to surprise the fugitives, the poachers. He waited in the village for some time until the evening, making plans of how he would attack them. And when the time came, he would be ready. A boy runs to Gorgai and asks him to speak to the leader of the poachers. The village want to avoid a fight, if possible. Gorgai thought for a moment, but he agreed to speak to the poachers. Needless to say, the poachers were not happy. They knew Gorgai was working for Catalea, complaining about the rich and that it's okay for them, but not for the poachers to take the hides. Gorgai could certainly sympathize with the man, however, but Gorgai had a job to do and always kept his word. This man was an outlaw, so he should give up or die. Gorgai's threat fell on idle ears, and so the poachers engaged them in the village. Gorgai had a plan though, he hid his men behind one of the barns and with arrows he fired them at the poachers, luring them closer and closer into the village. Here his men lie in wait to attack at the right time. These poachers were natural hunters and all had bows. Gorgai nearly took an arrow. After a few shots, the poachers had taken the bait and they were lured into the village. When the time was right, Poor guy gave the order. Easily. The poachers, most of them ran, and those who didn't had been slain. Gorga could feel it in his muscles, a burning sensation, a desire to fight more. Two of the poachers he took as prisoners. He would ransom them at Mycera. He also took what armor was of value, and yes, there was some leather, something he could sell for a good profit. Gorgai sold the weapons he found from the poachers to the village and also the leather in which he found from them. If it was indeed illegally obtained, he didn't want the attention in the city. When all his affairs were finished, he headed back to Mysia. Once back, he went and met Catala again to see if she had any other work and to receive his payment. She had no other work, but he'd made a friend in the city, he guessed, for now. Now he had the coin he wanted, he was able to go to the tavern and meet Karina and pay off her debts. It had been longer than he had hoped, but he had the money and he wanted someone like Karina in his company. Without hesitation he agreed to pay the debts, putting a lot of trust in Karina, but if he could trust her, it would be worth a lot more. As he made his way out the tavern, he noticed a man. A face he recognized. He didn't think much of it for now, but was he being watched? Karina had a sword, but he also gave her a bow and arrows. She wasn't much of a fighter yet, so a bow would have to do for now. He also managed to get some more equipment for his men, who seemed to be showing their worth. Also to his surprise, one of the poachers who was his prisoner wanted to join his band. With a chuckle, Gorgai accepted. Now to this day, no one really knows what took Gorgai east from Mycia, but this is when the trouble began. The great Kazate city of Umbrella was under siege by the Empire. Gorgai chose to use this opportunity to attack a nearby village, and that's when he saw Bacarius of the Embers again. He stayed away from them, he kept an eye as they left, and when they did, the raid began. With all the men at arms at the siege, this was as good a time as any to raid a village. 
The village had a defensible position, however, on top of a hill, but Gorgai had a plan. His men would pepper them with arrows from the bottom of the hill, whilst five or six of his men would do a large flank and come at them from behind. If he timed it right, all of them would charge at the same time and break their small defense. They exchanged arrows for some time. Gorga even took an arrow to the shoulder, but it wasn't too deep. He could continue. At that point, he gave the signal to advance. The defenders had a small wall of shields, which Gorgai knew his men without shields themselves would not be able to break through. So he went round to the right and decided to loose some arrows into the side of the shield wall. He was charged and almost lost his own life, but his quick thinking managed to slay the enemy against him. And then he laid arrow after arrow. The men at the rear came just at the right time, and together they slaughtered the defenders. These were trained men, and they didn't go out without a fight. By the time it was all over, only a few men remained. Gorgai himself finishing off the last. Although they lost many, they still rejoiced. Twelve dead, five wounded. Enemy has ten dead, six wounded. No six, Gorgai took his prisoners to sell at the local city. As many of Gorgai's men were either wounded or dead, it took them quite some time to finish the raid on the village, but all the villagers had left, and they just had to search for what supplies they could. Content with their plunder, they made their way back west, and noticing a prela had withstood the siege and was still standing, and the siege camp had left. It was a good time to head back to Mysia. It was dark when they were in the forests, and they noticed bands of looters going around, probably looking for any leftovers from the siege. Gorgai and his party had to be very careful, they had too many prisoners and too much valuables on them. But Chase was on. Sixteen men had found them and were chasing after them. Reluctantly, Gorgai had to get rid of his wounded and his prisoners. They were slowing them down and there's no way they could have made it out of the valley alive. The looters pursued them but soon lost interest as they got close to the next village. He took refuge there a small while until he knew the coast was clear, and then made his way back to Mysia, hoping not to run into them again. But to his surprise, he saw a small skirmish. The looters had been attacked by a local guard caravan, and their fate was ended there. It was just before midday when he returned to Mysia. He sold the cotton he got from the raid, clothes and leather also. He also smelted all the tools and weapons he found. Whilst in the blacksmith, he was inspired to make his own sword, and so he did. He crafted a fine blade, nothing that would fetch a hefty price, but something he could call his own, so he called it Gorgai's first, as it wouldn't be the first weapon he crafted. Gorgai's next decision was to head to the north, where there was a sea. He thinks the fishing villagers there might have some produce or some trade items for him that is untapped, so he made his way. He went past one village, the village of Velos, and he sold horses of all kinds. He managed to recruit one man. He carried on north, through the woods, over the hills, until he arrived at the village of Nortanisa. Here he was able to get some fresh recruits and buy some fish. And to his surprise, the fish was very cheap. It's just what he was looking for. He then made his way to another local village nearby called Hetania. Here he was able to recruit another man to the cause. It was early the next morning he decided to make tracks back to Mysia as he didn't want the fish to spoil and it could be a few days before he got there. He successfully got back without any trouble on the road. He went straight market and sold all the fish he had claimed, save a couple of pieces for him and his lads. But he'd finally made a decent profit. He must have been doing something right because people were beginning to recognize him, and more and more men wanted to join in with his warband. Now he had more money and men, he bought a couple of horses, and he would go back to the fishing village.
Before Gorgai set out on his next trade envoy, Gorgai celebrated his recovery and the recent profits from trade. At the tavern, he exclaimed his fighting skills to the locals, and they would want him to prove it in the arena. And so he did. On the morrow, first thing, he set out to the arena and met with the tournament master. He spoke with the tawny master for some time. He explained how the games work and how in the past they were a lot bloodier with real weapons. But in these days, due to the Empire's rule, it was quite different. The worst you would get is a broken bone or concussion. He explained that past emperors were uncertain of the people's morals and wanted to steer them away from such violent games to a more virtuous kind. All the best fighters in the area would team up and pummel each other. Not as entertaining as the old gladiatorial games when they would spill each other's guts though. These days people survive the games, but accidents do happen. But there was no tournament on, only the chance to practice in the arena against 29 other men. And that's all Gorgai wanted, to prove his worth. It was time to remember who he was, who he was with a blade in his hand. He had done it. He had defeated all his opponents in the arena and held his head high as he got a small reward afterwards. But it was time to head out again. And so he did. He went north to the fishing village, stopping in every village on his way, grabbing supplies, seeing if men wanted to join, staying where he could for the night not to get too cold. He was getting used to these lands, used to the trails and the roads, which made travelling around a lot easier for him. He went to the village, he gathered what fish he could again, and head back to Mysia to make a healthy profit, nearly double. With his renewed confidence, he set out on the road to look for brigands and looters, and he found some. A party much larger than his own had converged down from the hills towards his own, thinking they could make a quick gold coin or two from Gorgai's men. <coughs> They picked a fight with not just any ordinary Northman. They picked a fight with Gorgai Barkskin and he was ready and eager. The looters charged head on. Gorgai and a few of his men loosed a couple of arrows to weaken their resolve. But Gorgai wanted this fight. He wanted to get up and close and let the gods see the might that was inside him, burning to get out. And that was it. They started to charge. Gorga could taste it. But before the battle even began, the cowards turned and ran. Gorga was furious. Stand and fight, he said. Stand and fight. But none of them would heed. They just ran. Gorga would have to wait another day before he drew his blade on a worthy opponent. And for now, 
Him and his men were in high spirits, not a single loss. But the enemy, dead or fled. It was a good day, a victory at least. But not the victory the gods wanted, and Gorgai knew this. It was time, he thought, to head back home to the north. There he could truly train his men, bring glory to the Sturgeon people, appease the gods first for blood, and more importantly, revenge, find those who betrayed him and those who attacked him in that village. On the last night before setting off to go north, Gorgai had a dream. A vivid dream, it felt real. He was standing in the cold and frozen Northlands. He could feel the cold around him, surrounded by southerners and northern bodies. Was it a battle to come? A vision from the gods? Gorgai knew this was only the beginning. The beginning of a long, bloody adventure. Hello friends, thank you for making it to the end of my video. I um, I really, really appreciate that. Uh, it's very long, uh, but I had a lot of fun making it. Um, and I, I, I can't wait to make the rest of them for Gorgai's tale, a Bannerlord tale. As always, please, could you leave me some feedback? Uh, what you think was good, what was bad, what can I make better? And I will act upon that on my next videos. Uh, also, leave ideas, you know, something I could maybe put in to make it more interesting for you guys. Um, a lot of it is improvised, you can probably tell, and sorry for the name pronunciation on some cities and towns, because it's probably wrong. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I hope you can uh, put up with that. Let me know if I have pronounced anything wrong, and I'll get it right next time. But yeah, thank you again, I really appreciate it. Subscribe if you want a notification for the next video. Like it, it will help me get more popular on YouTube, that will help. Uh, but most importantly, as always, guys... Glory to the Empire, Benoni here, have a good day.